it's literally an agreement reality where people talk about how conventional medicine is backed by science and research and alternative or functional medicine is not. That's literally wrong. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the fact that it's called alternative medicine, like, right. no, it's actually medicine. Yeah. It's yep. actually medicine. It's medicine, period. I, I'd rather call it natural medicine, but, yep. you know, if we're going to call it anything that's not just plain old medicine. Welcome to Heal. On today's episode, Dr. Jesse Haymeyer and I dive deep and talk shop like we never have on Heal before. Jesse is an expert in data-driven functional medicine, and we get to geek out on functional lab tests and the nitty-gritty of our favorite supplements. She helps us demystify the differences between the different kinds of hormone tests, food allergy tests, and immune trackers out there on the market today, and why it matters to get the right health partner to interpret your normal blood work from your doctor. Dr. Jesse Haymeyer is the physician founder of Well Empowered, where she practices data-driven, outcome-oriented functional medicine. Dr. H earned her master's of science in human nutrition and functional medicine from the University of Western States, doctorate in chiropractic medicine from the University of Health and Sciences, and bachelor of arts from UCLA. She is an IFM certified practitioner, a licensed dietitian nutritionist, and a certified nutrition specialist. A true rock star in functional medicine, join the geek out sesh with me, your host, Dr. Sarah Marshall. Well, this is just super exciting. Jesse, thank you so much for agreeing to be on Heal and contributing to us. It is such a pleasure to be here with you today, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, I I get to pri pri privilege, speaking of getting words out of my mouth, we were just talking about that before we hit record, to get to spend the next hour picking the brain of Dr. Jesse Haymeyer. And you are a chiropractor with a master's degree in nutrition and functional medicine and actually a certified functional medicine practitioner. And, you know, when we first got connected, it was like we were finishing each other's sentences and like, oh, my God, you too. So this is going to be great. I'm like, I don't even know where the conversation is going to take us, but I'm just really excited to be here and really get into yet another conversation of what does it take to heal? How do we actually heal? What is it like, what is, this has been coming up with my clients lately is like, what is optimal health? What does that actually even mean? You know, I just had a client yesterday and we were talking about how, you know, by all conventional medical standards, she's like perfectly healthy. She ticks all the boxes. The MDs are like, you're good. And she knows there's things she wants to work on. She's also an older parent and she's really committed to having extraordinary health for her grandkids. Well, her youngest is four. So she's got some years ahead of her. Right. And I've had clients come to me and they're like, I'm committed to extraordinary health and well-being into my eighties and nineties. And I'm not knocking anything, but the, the conventional doctors literally are like, it's not what the system is organized for. Right. And so I think that this could be a really cool conversation for us to explore. Like, how do people access that? And what does it mean? Like when I was reading through your bio about like guiding people to create health and vitality that transforms their experience of life and alters what's possible for them. And, and right there is like our well-being can be access to creativity, self-expression, levels of life we've never even considered possible for us because right here where we are with this amount of energy, this kind of sleep, this kind of digestion, it doesn't even occur to us to go write a book or travel the world or whatever. Because it's like, well, I can't even consistently get my groceries handled, my taxes done, take care of the kids and handle work right now. Your brain won't even think about those levels. But it, it is something I experience with my practice all the time is like as people get healthier, this like creativity opens up and the self-expression opens up into like getting to live their best life. And like sometimes I feel like that's almost cliche now because it's sort of like... Some of the things we've been saying as naturopaths and as functional medicine doctors is now sort of all over the lingo, but I mean it, God damn it. Like I'm serious about it, living your best life. It's not a tagline. <laughs> Truly right. It is not marketing. I completely agree. And yeah, I mean, exactly to what you were saying, what to your point, right? Our, our health and vitality is the foundation for authoring our lives, right? It really is what makes us living the life we intend to live possible. 
And to me, you know, whether someone is struggling with their digestion or their energy levels or, you know, their, their hormones gone wackadoodle or weight, whatever it is, that is what it's all about, right? It's about who people get to be for themselves and for others and what they get to create when their health is handled, right? They, they feel their best. They look their best. There's a level of confidence and empowerment. You know, it really, it, it changes everything. It changes what becomes possible. Yeah. And it's, it's like, we are so conditioned that there's this acceptance of like, this is a conversation I'm always struggling with how to best navigate what's normal as we age versus what's average. And I say average, like if you take 10,000 people and you create the average of what's there, like on average, there's more joint pain. Our skin does this. Your energy is going to slow down. It's quote normal is the word we use. But what we really mean is it's average that our brain won't function as well. We'll have memory issues. Our energy will decline. Insomnia will start to kick in. We're not sleeping as well. Like, like, and these become, and I hear people say it all the time. We're like, well, I don't know. Is this even something we can work on? Or I just have to accept, like, I'm getting older. Yeah. And what's yeah. really fascinating is sometimes I hear that out of the mouths of 35 year olds. Oh, I'm uh, me too. And it makes me laugh. Right. I think I heard someone a couple of weeks ago, I think she was 31 who said, well, you know, maybe it's just because I'm older now. I was like, you're older than years old. I mean, right? exactly. I mean, you're not you're 20. That's five. true. Yeah, exactly. you know. <laughs> it's Good. Like a riot. Totally. And I think also, you know, the one thing that, you know, we could acknowledge is, you know, average for our society, right? There are other countries where their average looks different. Now, yeah. unfortunately, those are becoming the exception, but yeah. still they are. We've been working to bring some other cultures down to our level. <laughs> truly, <laughs> truly. Yeah. Just ship them those Fritos, baby, all day right? long. <laughs> and high fructose corn syrup beverages yes. is one of the big ones. But yes. So yeah. one of the things that stood out, like I want to, I got, I'm like, ah, so many questions I want to ask you. So let's frame this inside of the conversation of, of how do we maximize optimal health and what is, yeah. what is optimal health? So I want to start yeah. there. So for me, where I would start with that question is actually having the individual answer that, right? Because what is optimal health for an, is an individual, you know, creation, Right. And it, and it's a creation based on where one is in this moment in time. Right. So optimal health at, you know, call it 25, it, it would be totally fine and appropriate if that looks different than optimal health at 80. Right. There will be things that one cares about at 25 that will not be nearly as important as when someone's 80 and vice versa. Right. And so that's totally natural and normal. And so I think it's also, well, you know, you and I are very, are very well grounded in the work of epigenetics, right? The work of caring for our genes such that they manifest health and vitality. There are some people who, based on their genes, right, their optimal health, there are, you know, you know, 20% of genes are going to be more deterministic, obviously the, the vast minority, but still there, those are, that is true, right? So that person's going to author a different story of what optimal health is for them. Now we never want to, we always want to make sure people really get that 80% is a huge 80% is a huge amount. And there is yes. some debate that even when you bring in the mental emotional of doing trauma therapy and unwinding, right. and unweaving on ancestral, I'm really going to tongue tie myself today. This is great. I so here's what's funny. I haven't been drinking caffeine and I ordered coffee this morning and I forgot to say decaf. So this is actually what happened. Apparently I should not have caffeine because I can't talk. Isn't it a great self study though? Oh yeah. <laughs> An N of one, but here's what happens. I'm actually scrambling my brain with these extra chemicals, which is really funny. And uh, yes. So what I was trying to say is there are some people like I just was listening to a talk by Bruce Lipton and he says 95% of health is lifestyle and mm -hmm. choices we make and work that we do on ourselves. And only 5% is determined by our genetics because he's talking about 
the ways we can transform our thoughts and our limited beliefs and do work on trauma such that we're healing these patterns. What I was trying to say was yeah. ancestrally inherited patterns yeah. that we're starting to see all these interconnection between mind and body. And like, you know, I talk about him on almost every episode, Gabor Mate's work, what he's been highlighting. Yeah. And there's more and more people out there, Dr. Mario Martinez, who specifically does a lot of work in longevity. And he was a psychologist who then started to study longevity and he started to get more interested in functional medicine so he came from the brain side and then moved over into the body side and then gabor mate started as a physician has moved into the psychology and trauma and addiction mm -hmm. side of things so basically somewhere between 80 and 95 percent right actually have control over making a difference in yes in in so you know I, but i do think most importantly that definition of optimal health needs to come from the individual. In other yeah. words, what is your definition of optimal health? If you could just write the story, and this is actually an exercise I engage with people on, is let's time travel five years. Mm -hmm. You know, time travel five years and write the story of what it is to be you with your health as you intend and desire it be in five years. Right. So and great. The last question on my intake is, I want you to describe the ultimate breakthrough of where you will be in your house, in your health 12 months from now. Love so, it. I, you Amazing. know, yeah, exactly. Yes. And, and there's something powerful too about for us as practitioners knowing like, I need to know where we're pointing the boat. Yes. And that's something that I see, you know, I'm going to just keep pulling the comparison of conventional medicine, just in terms of the system of conventional medicine, not the individuals who are in it. The individuals who are in it are extraordinarily dedicated heart-based kick-ass people, but the way the system is structured, I've never had an, an primary care physician MD who's asked me like, what are my goals in life? Totally. For, for myself and for my well-being. But it makes a difference because I'm balancing both what I know as a medical practitioner of what this person in front of me needs to be responsible for that maybe they're not clear on. There really is a propensity towards cancer in their family and what we can do about it. There really is like they're tipping in the direction of diabetes from pre-diabetes. We got to look at that. But it's not just about that. I want to know, well, do they are they committed to being a marathon runner and they haven't walked around their block? Or are they just wanting to get down on the floor with their kids to be able to, you know, like, and I might encourage them to stretch some of those goals out a little further if I think they're sort of nearsighted, but it does make a difference, you know what those specific goals are, how we're going to target what we're going to do and how, what it's going to take, how long it's going to take. It's like, I make analogies to the financial world all the time. Most financial advisors, once you do the net worth calculation, what they ask you is what does success mean to you and how much money do you need by what point in time in your life? Because you can't do the calculations without it. And so it's the same thing in health and that definition of what your optimal health is. It gives us the game board, what we're playing in. The other thing though, is that manifesting your destiny, that manifesting an intentionality is like, until you've defined it, you don't even know what you're trying to cause. And it's so important to bring word and bring language. Like as you're talking, I'm actually realizing like, I haven't done this exercise in a while. I haven't really created it for myself as a, as like, what now am I living into? You know, I got myself through so much history of illnesses and things that I've dealt with over the years and healed a lot of things that it's like, what would that five year be for me as a yeah. declaration of the created future? I, I love that it, that it has your mind going there. And, yeah. you know, w when we take this offline, we can do it together. It would be, I'd That'd love be to hear what you come up with. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. But to your point, right, it, it's all of this work we do with people is relation to an, an, an intended outcome. Right. And some of those outcomes will be around labs. I, I don't want to be pre diabetic. Right. And, you know, I want to be able to be confident that as, as I can be, that my future isn't the same as my, you know, mother or father who had a heart attack at 50 or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. Stuff like that. And then we can, can look at numbers and see what they are telling us about the current state of affairs. And then guide people through the changes that are required to vote for their vitality, to vote for their longevity, yeah. right? Put, put, I think about it like I always like to say, like, okay, if I were to go to Vegas, 
would I pull, put all chips on your health? Like if I'm, if I, I want to be able to put all my chips on, yes, like your health and vitality. Yes. All chips there. Right. And so that's, that's kind of what we're working towards. But then I would also say the other part of that is experience, right? People beyond just, of course, certain level of energy, but just really that experience of thriving, which is an integration of everything, right? You you feel fully expressed. You feel connected to others. You experience joy and wonder, and and you're creating, and and all the things that make us feel like we are living our best lives. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And and the interplay between those, where there can be factors out in our life where we're not having those experiences or we don't feel connected or we're dealing with access, you know, difficulty accessing our joy and where that trickles back on our health. Cause it's like, I mean, I'll just speak from my own experience when those things are missing for me. And like most of my podcast audience, I've taken them through this year of grief of my dad passing and like how that's impacted things. And there's been some really dark periods where like, I just haven't been able to access that joy. You think my commitment to my exercise plan and my eating, like whoop, right out the window that goes, you know, it's like, it's much harder for me to generate some of my, you know, it goes either way. Sometimes I know actually like my emotional life is unstable. So I get really committed to my physical health because I just, I need ground under my feet. And I'm like, if I sleep well, and if I eat well, and I move my body, I take Henry for a walk. Like, I just know that's going to give me at least a better solid footing, but it, it can go either way. Right. So you can have them. And then there's the experience of life that we get to have when we're moving through optimizing our health and well-being and what that what that creates. There's sort of a chicken or the egg thing happening there. Mm -hmm. So you brought up data and that's an area that I'd love to actually get into kind of the nitty gritty with you, because it's something that I think you in particular emphasize a lot that I love. And I'm curious, like, you know, do you have like every single person that comes to see me, I want them to do these same things. And what are they? Or is it, how do you individualize it? And like, what are some of your favorite, maybe non-standard data points you like to get? Yeah. So to answer the first question, definitely not the same thing for everyone, Mm -hmm. right? So I say I practice data-driven natural medicine, but what it really, which is true, but in a more expansive term, I would call it information-driven. Mm -hmm. Right. And so in a first conversation, I'm getting a lot of information in that conversation, which actually informs what data I want labs. Right. And so then the labs that I order are a combination of, you know, what we might call standard lab tests. People get them done at Quest or, you know, like that, as well as specialty lab tests. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of this, I'm sure we use a lot of the same ones with some frequency, right? But with those, you know, standard lab tests, I do gather a lot of information. So I let people know, like, you are going to feel like you're donating blood, but it's not because it's cute. It's because it's actionable, right? So we get all of this information to understand either, either, you know, like what are the barriers to healing or what, what's the gateway to healing? Um, You know, what's at the root? what's the root cause of this person's symptoms or, you know, health conundrums, the things that people are like scratching their heads going, I've seen, you know, you see these people, I've seen every specialist under the sun. Yeah. I'm theoretically healthy and I feel like hell, right. There's something going on. Or they know there's something wrong, but nobody can figure out what treatment to do for it. And so they just get stopped in that process. Yeah. 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 Totally. 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 So so yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, the in the quote unquote standard lab tests, I do a lot of assessments of nutrients. I do a lot of assessments of inflammation. Do you um, share like some of the your what yeah. your go tos are? Because one of the things we do on Heal is like I'm okay getting into the details and the weeds. Yeah. Like people can take it, and it's I like to totally. be informative. So totally, totally. So on the inflammation front, the kind of the more common ones that I go to HSCRP, right? High sensitivity C-reactive protein, homocysteine. I know some people think about it more like a metabolic marker of B12 and folate, but I think about it also as an inflammatory marker. Yeah. So I'll do that. LPPLA2, which is, you know, like more centric to the cardiovascular system in the way of inflammation. 
I don't do erythrocyte sedimentation rate, ESR, that often just because it seems more like acute related and mostly yeah. I'm working with people with long-term problems rather than immediate problems. I'll use it once in a while, yeah. uh, but not often. So those in the, in the inflammatory front, those are the three that I, I'm leaning on. You I know, checked with the most- two out of the three boxes on my <laughs> standards. Yeah, yeah. I don't do that. I don't see a lot of cardiovascular. It's just for whatever reason doesn't come through. So, but I do, I do the high sensitivity, high sensitivity C-reactive protein all the time, homocysteine. And I always run a full iron panel on people because I, in men, I actually see that iron levels too high can be corresponded to a lot of issues. And and there's a lot of women where they're not getting categorized as anemic, but their ferritin, their actual iron storage is so low. And I had a doctor last year, I was at an endocrinology seminar and she gave out a pearl that her understanding is, is that you need a ferritin of at least a hundred to be able to convert your T4 to T3 in your thyroid to actually have your active thyroid mm-hmm. hormone convert over. I haven't specifically seen a lot of that specifically correlate, but I'm like, Hey, I'm going to look for it and pay attention. Yeah. A lot of my women, their iron levels are fine. The red blood cells are the right size and shape basically, but their ferritin levels are abysmal and they might be struggling with like a subclinical hypothyroid. Their thyroid's just kind of chugging along, but not doing great. And I look at absorption yeah. then, and I look at how their body's able to simulate the minerals. So then when you do nutrition testing, see, this is an area that I've been like, I'm skeptical, even as a doctor, like I have clients that have done nutrition panels, either urine analysis metabolites, or they'll do blood nutrition, you know, where you can do B12 and you can look at some things. And I just get so much conflicting information from different doctors I look up to about how useful that information really is like one of the things I do coach my patients in, and I'm sure you do too, is like with functional medicine labs, it's not quite the way we typically think of labs. Like we tend to think of labs as an absolute, like I either am positive or I'm negative. And there's this like very binomial yes, no kind of way of things. But in functional medicine, it's always tricky because it's like, if we actually did draw your blood every day for 30 days straight, living life, we're going to see fluctuations and variations in it. And then you even get into the weeds of how good of a lab company is it because the reliability of consistency of lab tests, that that conversation comes on, yes. particularly around food sensitivity tests. That's one Agreed. that I comes up a lot. And most people aren't willing to spend $400 to get their food sensitivity tested, you know, week after week after week to see how it compares. So we don't always see that information. But what are some of your like, do you do you think urine metabolite analysis is useful for nutrition? Do you do hair analysis? Do you just stick to serum? Like, what do you find is the most effective? So I do blood, but not always serum. So okay. for nutrients, I do. I, I you know I like you. I've been skeptical about the functional medicine, so to speak. Like you know, my, I don't need mean to call out names. Yeah. It's just yeah. like they're just different panels that I'm not super confident in. But I will, I'll use my quest to get, you know, like you said, the ferritin, iron, TBC, all those, TIBC, all those different yeah. things on, on iron, right? I'll also use it for, I do magnesium RBC, so intracellular magnesium versus serum magnesium. I do serum zinc. So it's kind of a little bit of like, okay, where is this nutrient most located in the body so that I can better understand what, what to test? Do I want intracellular or, ex, or, or extracellular, Right. So I'll do, what are some of the other things I'll do? Yeah, B12 and folate. I do serum, although I was reading something the other day that was recommending intracellular folate. So I haven't played around with that myself. Have you played around with intracellular folate at all? No, I I kind of have, I generally don't test for folate and B12 at all. And I just have everybody on B complexes because we just so need the metabolic support. So it yeah. hasn't been something I've done a lot of. Yep, yep. That, this is an area actually where I've like not veered into a lot of nutritional testing. Yep. And but I have clients who bring me their panels and I look at them and kind of assess, you know, how useful yes. is this information. Yeah. And you know, when I when I order tests, there are two different ways that I think about tests. Is it is it gonna be, is it well, first of all, is it actionable or interesting? I always want it to be actionable. Unless someone's like, I just want to know, I'll totally pay $600 Mm -hmm. for that specialty. I just want to see what it says. Okay. I mean, fine. If that's how you, you know, if that's your luxury, there are far worse things, you know, right? So great. Let's do that thing. 
But, but I also, sometimes there are times where I'm like, I am pretty darn sure this is going to be the right solution, but I really want them to be able to understand. So yeah. some of it's, I see it as an educational opportunity, right? Yeah. So that ultimately when I go and say like, Hey, we really need you taking this supplement. They're more likely to do it because they have numbers to back what I'm yeah. saying. And you get right? to track progress. You know, you get to yes. actually see the difference that gets made over time. Yeah. Totally. Totally. So some of the other nutrients I regularly test Quest has a really nice omega assessment, omega check under their cardio IQ panels. I really like. That's been coming up for me more and more. There's actually a company I am going to call them out because I think they do really good work. Um, call them out in a good way is Brainspan. Okay. And they, it's the only thing they do is this omega test and uh-huh. they will go through and, you know, your omega threes, your omega sixes, your inflammatory status, like how kind of your general, the whole, the whole picture of it. But they also do a brain memory reaction test that you take online at the same time as you do it. And they can actually like connect your results of inflammatory patterns and how your megas are to how your brain is functioning. And so many people are concerned about brain fog and memory yes. and, and focus. It It's a great educational tool. They're pretty affordable tests too. And their thing is you do the test once, you apply the treatment, you do a test again every month for three months to encourage the changes. And then you can retest quarterly or annually, whatever you want to do. But you you basically do three tests in a row the first three months. And yeah. the gentleman who started the company, he was, I apologize if I get some of the details wrong, but this was my memory. He came to speak at one of our conferences. He was a doctor for the army, I believe. And one of the things he started to really investigate is the impact of all of the head trauma and even the like sub concussive head trauma that our soldiers are dealing with. And what they were noticing in autopsies of these young kids coming back from war with essentially like Alzheimer's disease level brains. And they're going, okay, what's the deal? And he started to put together one of the downsides is the military food and what they're eating is highly inflammatory diet. And when you have people with high omega-6s, low omega-3, and lots of chronic inflammation in their body, when they have head trauma, it massively increases the impact of that head trauma. And if mm-hmm. they have really healthy brains with good healthy fats and low inflammation status, our bodies are more resilient and we don't have the same concussive brain trauma issues which is just fascinating. So this has been his whole career and he was doing all this research and science. Well, then he started to get into some animal trainers came to him and they were like, we want you to test our dolphins. We want you to test our, like, like he worked with SeaWorld. And so he actually, and like, we tend to think of like how smart dolphins are and like where they are in the brain capacity. And so optimal when they're testing optimal omega-3 levels is like an eight, but if you can get to a 12, you're in this like exceptional range, which almost none of my clients even come near an eight, let alone a 12. But he said, guess what dolphins omega-3 concentration is of their RBCs? And it's 16 to 18. Oh my so they God. have this incredibly high levels. So they're just in this immense state. And he talked about like how important fatty acids are for our brain health. And that the anthropologists are saying that this is the first time in human history, all of our evolution, that our fatty acid status is declining. Mm. And if you think like, okay, why do we care? Well, our brain is literally made out of fat. And what we've always said is part of what's made humans humans and able to do what we've done is because our brains grew in size and grew in capacity and our thinking capacity and our frontal cortex evolved such that we were able to differentiate ourselves as humans versus the way that the rest of the mammalian you know, species operate. And we've attributed a lot of that to the nutritional status of the way we assimilated fats in our diets and fatty acids. Well, in the last hundred years, we've literally rolled back evolutionary progress. We could do a whole podcast on that. Yeah, absolutely. But I love that you say the omegas because that's one that I think that gets overlooked a lot as like, not so much even screening, but as like, uh, how do we optimize health? Like that's one that most people don't, they're not going, they might think of the nutrition in terms of the Bs and the, and the vitamins and the minerals, but I don't see as many people talking about the omega status. And that's like huge. Oh, it, there's almost nothing that I, it can't make a difference for, right? When so, it, like truly hormones, like, okay. brain function, well, right, immunity. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. It's like throw omegas at it. Right. So even in that case, it's like, 
okay, even if you know you are going to be recommending omega-3 fatty acids, supplementation, increasing in their diet, all those different things. Two things I think about like how much, right? Because yeah. when I get a number back that is, you know, 3.5, I'm reaching for 2000 milligrams easy. And if I have someone who's at, you know, 5.5, 5.6, and I like to see on the quest one, at least at eight, for most people, yep. then I might be reaching for, you know, 1200 or, or we might be saying, they might be saying, Oh, yeah, I used to eat fish. I don't even know why I stopped eating it. Like, I'll go back to doing that. Okay, yeah. great. You know, and so, so it, it, it is definitely useful to have that number. And I'm going to have to check out Brainspan because that sounds like a very It's just cool, a neat tool, the way that yeah. they put it together and everything. And so I've used it a lot. And I, a lot of my clients really in the education and the motivation side, when they yeah. can see the scores that happen from their brain function and then have it shift and change, it's yeah. again, very motivating for like, you know, the first three months, six months, fine. But then they're like, why am I spending $80 a month on fish oil? Like, really, do I have to keep taking this? And yeah, it totally. really brings it home. Is it a finger prick or blood draw or what is it? Finger prick home test. Oh, yeah. nice. So you awesome. just can ship That's it great. to them and then, yeah, yeah, it's really great. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. I will take that. I will. So we've talked then, about, inf yeah, go ahead. Oh, we, we, I mean, we wouldn't be you know, the practitioners we are, if we didn't talk about vitamin D. I right. Mean, okay, course, good. I was like, what's vitamin? next? Yeah. <laughs> I would say, you know, just in the way of like nutrients co most commonly assessed. Sometimes yeah. I do the other B vitamins or, you know, yeah. chromium or stuff like that. But mostly what we just talked about, those are, those are my more common go-tos. And then, yeah. you know, of course, vitamin D. What's probably. your optimal vitamin D level? It depends on the person, right? If okay. someone has an autoimmune condition, I'll, push it a little bit higher, you know, and by higher, I mean like uh, 65 to 75 to 80. Right, um, me too. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then for, you know, kind of like the average gel, I might be totally fine with 45 to 60, okay. you know, maybe 50 to 60 being a sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. I've always said, you know, for my chronic illness patients that are working through stuff, my optimal is between 60 and 80. And ah, then, love it. you know, general maintenance can be, you know, 50 or 60. But then it's like these last couple of years with everything through COVID, I just was like, look, this is a really cheap and easy solution to potentially prevent a lot of problems. So we just I kept everyone, you know, on that upper level. Yeah. 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 yeah that's great. I love when I mean, like, you know, it's been 15 years since I left school and I go do continuing education every year. But like you just sometimes it's nice to get the validation of like, OK, <laughs> Totally. I'm We're doing scoop, things right. You know? yes. Because here's one of the things that I run into as a physician and a lot of us, I mean, much of what we're talking about is science backed. It, it actually is. That's one of the biggest myths drives me. I could swear a lot right now. I'm not going to. Drives me crazy about this. Like it's a myth. It's literally an agreement reality where people talk about how conventional medicine is backed by science and research and alternative or functional medicine is not. That's literally wrong. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the fact that it's called alternative medicine, like, right. no, it's actually medicine. Yeah. It's yeah. actually medicine. It's medicine, period. I, I'd rather call it natural medicine. But, yeah. you know, if we're going to call it anything that's not just plain old medicine. Exactly. You know? <laughs> and, and that's where I've really, you know, mostly I've loved the functional medicine movement that's happened in the integrative medicine movement that's happened over the last 20 years. It's been a little tricky when integrative docs come out and start claiming things that they invented that the naturopaths have been doing for 200 years. I'm like, hey, 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 slow yes. your roll. We have history yes. on this. But also, it's just good publicity. It's like, and it's good for people. Yeah. And I'm really glad that it's moving forward more and more where we have these options to get, get into these conversations. And what's really interesting too about, I don't know why my brain's going here, but it just has to do with the science backing is supplementation, right? Like, <laughs> I get it. We have an already existing conversation or an experience of a pill being medicine. And for many people, one pill is enough. <laughs> and in pharmaceuticals, it should be, you don't want to take 15 Advil. You don't want it, you know, like, but you got to think about supplements as being food concentrated food. And one of the things I say is like, you look at those pills in your hand, you're like, oh my God, that's so many pills. But if it was blueberries, would that be so many blueberries? Or if it was almonds, would that be so many almonds, right? Let's shift it a little bit. 
and it is concentrated, but this is something that I find happens a lot is people are like, oh, I tried fish oil. It didn't make any difference. And I'm like, well, how much did you take? And they're like, well, one or two. And for some conditions, like if you're trying to move your cholesterol levels, if you're trying to seriously impact arthritis, the therapeutic dose can be upwards of like 6,000 milligrams a day. Even I've seen papers written where they were putting in 8,000 milligrams of DHA to be able to make a shift in how the brain function in ADD and ADHD. You know how much fish oil that is? It's like 16 caps a day. Right. And right. so a lot of times what I actually see is the research papers, the science back up therapeutic dose. And there's this difference between therapeutic dose and a maintenance dose. And so there's what is there to maintain health? And then that brings back to the question, well, what's the health we're trying to maintain? Do we want to have a normal life in our 70s and 80s like everybody else is having? Well, then, yes, take your one capsule of omega-3s now until the rest of your life and it'll do what it does. And then there's this other part of like a therapeutic dose where we're trying to actually, which is usually far larger numbers of pills than people have ever comprehended taking. And I Truly. always have to work through this conversation of recontextualizing it for them and what it what is actually worth it and how to do it and how to optimize taking them. So I'm curious your approach in this yeah. world. Well, a few things. One is one is if we could just step back and talk about that one omega pill a day because yeah. you know you and I both know there are high quality Mm -hmm. uh, companies who produce supplements that are, have, you know, active ingredients in abundance. And what we know we want in them is in them. And what we want and not out is not toxins right? or so, other right, fluff. Exactly. So I'm, you know, I, it, it, one of the things I'll do with people, and I'm sure you do the same thing is I'll do supplement audits, right? So they'll say, you know, I'm taking this one omega three pill a day. Oh, what's the dose on that one? Oh, it's, it's a thousand. Right. And then we, look at the actual ingredients and we find yeah. that, you know, 700 milligrams of the 1000 is other omega threes, which are inactive, right? And basically right. have, you know, we don't know what they do, right? EPA and DHA is obviously what we care about, right? So it's like all of the marketing of supplements, right? Leads people, leaves people purchasing oftentimes supplements that are well marketed, but totally ineffective or inappropriate for their body's needs, right? Yeah. The dose isn't right. They've got junk added to them, whatever yeah. it is, right? So, and I just, this is a good place for this. Generally, my experience is because mostly people read the outside of the bottle and see what it's for, right? Yes. And, and it is kind of annoying. You, you almost need a master's degree in nutrition to read the back of the bottle, which is why I say work with a coach or a functional medicine practitioner or a physician, because it helps you work this out. My experience is vitamin C just costs what vitamin C costs in the world. Like almost across, there, there isn't like cheap and, you know, many of the supplements actually, and this is a whole nother thing that I don't know a lot about, but like a lot of our supplements actually all came from, come from the same place and they're just getting relabeled in different bottles. Not all, but a lot of them. Yes. And like fish oil is a great example. There just sort of is the cost of fish oil. So when you're comparing bottles and this one's cheaper than that one, there's a really simple answer because there's a less potent, cheaper version of it in there, or they just don't have as much of the active ingredient. Because when you actually start to compare milligram to milligram, it almost always all works out to the same price. Yeah, Most yeah. of the time, there's little variations here and there, yeah, but like, yeah, like yeah. when the broad sweeping, so a lot of times when my clients are like, well, I wanna go find this cheaper somewhere else, you might be able to shave off a couple bucks here and there for sure you can, but mostly there's not a big savings when you actually deal with the milligram therapeutic dose. It's going to be the same almost entirely across the board. That's what I, I mean. I haven't done like a massive audit, but I find in yeah. general and yes. then there's, there's effectiveness where there's some like I'm trying to think of a good example. Turmeric is kind of an like okay curcumin. example. Yeah. Yeah. Mar yeah. Mariva is wildly more, I mean, I right. see it clinically. I've played around clinically to kind of test the waters myself, yep. you know, and absolutely. So I you have, have the raw with, herb and then you have the yeah. active ingredient that's extracted. And sometimes I want the raw herb because I want the whole synergistic impact of it. But sometimes we're trying to specifically move the needle, like, you know, where you want to push this one aspect of it. And so then you do the concentrated you know, specific molecule that's the active ingredient and you can increase the dose sometimes like five, six, seven times 
and you're mm-hmm. going to pay for it. It's going to be an $80 bottle versus a $20 bottle because it's it's like a nutraceutical. It's like a pharmaceutical grade of a nutritional product. And, and they're not all created equal. So turmeric isn't just turmeric is just turmeric. And again, this is where people are like, I need a freaking master's degree or someone who already has one so that you can help doing this. Yes. And, you know, I, when I, to speak to how I guide people through their list of supplements, it's really important to me that people understand the, what the, how, and the why, right? What am I recommending in particular, not Mm -hmm. just like go start any fish oil. No, I want you on this specific fish oil. And you're going to take two capsules a day with food. You can take it with any meal, right? Versus a B vitamin when I don't want them to take it later in the day. And why am I having you take it? Not why would one take it, but why am I recommending you take it? So I do create a PDF for everyone who that is the what, the how, and the why. I send it to them via email. Sometimes, especially if there are nuances, I want to make sure they understand. Let's say I'm I want to make sure they understand why I'm encouraging them, recommending them to throw away their nature made B12 yeah. and start the one that I'm recommending, right? I, I might even make a little loom video and educate, you know, say like, here's what, you know, here's what I'm seeing about what you were taking. This is why I'm recommending this. And by the way, these are the outcomes I expect you to experience or that we'll see in your labs or maybe a little bit of both, right? Because then we will repeat their labs. Obviously, I want them to feel better, but we will repeat their labs kind of anywhere from two to three months after their first round to watch that needle move. And and it's like, you know, I don't know about you, but it's like, I'm sure you're the same way. It's like when I get labs and I feel like a kid before Christmas, I get so excited. I know. It's like the ultimate quiz. People love quizzes, but this is like the ultimate quiz. You're like, I get to see the inside of my body. Totally. Totally. It's so fun. Yes. That's great. Well, I know we just totally nerded out, but I actually think this is because these are questions that come to me all the time and people are dealing with like, you know, and and the stand, I do have kind of a quasi standard set of labs that I want people to do to begin with that are what I call like the annual, we want to keep an eye on things all the time. And, and it's usually what most primary care physicians would recommend. And then, then a little extra. You know, like I don't just do thyroid stimulating hormone. I do a full thyroid panel. Yes. I have any woman over the age of 30 dealing with energy issues and gut issues. I will have them test their auto antibodies for their thyroid as a routine practice once to Mm. just see. And if they come back negative, great, we're good. But I have seen people where they haven't gotten into issues with their thyroid yet, but they're antibodies are climbing early and that lets us know we're headed in the direction of having some issues with an autoimmune based thyroid disorder and like standard primary care almost never run antibodies for thyroid and they don't even know people have been on thyroid medication for years they have no idea that what they're dealing with is an autoimmune disease completely changes the treatment because now we want to deal with the whole autoimmune process not just give you levothyroxine or synthroid all the time where you're like i mean that might be part of the protocol, but yes. like, there's there's more information. And I think that like people also want to know, like then they can yes. be empowered by what they can do about it and how they can work through it. And so there's like, there is a standard set that I start with. And then I get into, you know, I didn't used to do as much of this, but I've gotten more, not full blown routine, but I often frequently end up recommending doing a salivary and urine analysis combo of hormones including cortisol, DHEA, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. Like it's more and more, I'm just getting a a data point screening on how people's hormones are. And then also doing a lot more stool analysis, gut testing for functional digestion. Yeah. And, And I, cause I've, what I've been seeing is I'll have people come in that they don't experience any symptoms in their gut. And I'm starting to relate this actually to trauma. One of the things, if you think about a gut reaction, we have a gut feeling about something Mm-hmm. If you've had to deal with a lot of excess stress or micro traumas in your life where you're just like constantly getting inundated, what some people do is they stop listening to their gut. They shut that off. Mm. So they're coming in, they're like, no, my digestion's great. And yeah. then I run a stool test on them and it's like, you're not absorbing anything. And it then totally. relates to what they are in there for. Cause if you don't have absorption and breakdown of your food, like 
we don't even need to get to supplements. We need to get you absorbing your food. So those have become, I wouldn't full blown call them routine, but I'm doing them a lot more often. Yeah. I, and I am with you. I, I do, especially that microbiome assessment. Mm -hmm. I do, I don't do it on everyone, but yeah. I do it with a good amount of frequency. Yeah. You know, there are just so many different things that it's connected to, whether it's, a, you know, a situation where it, the microbiome's all a mess and it's, you know, putting fuel on the fire that is autoimmunity, right? They already have an autoimmune condition and we're taking off their immune system, setting the stage for more to develop, right? Or, you know, a million other reasons why we might look at their, at their microbiome, but definitely yeah. that microbiome one is, is a common one. I'm curious for you, Sarah, the combination of the salivary and the urinary metabolites. Tell me a little bit more, if you would, about why you do that so combination. I, I mean, it, it, there's a specific lab company that this is what they put focus on. And I, again, I don't have any problem highlighting the good ones. So this is the Dutch test precision analytical. Yeah. yeah. And I, the way they explained it really made sense. And I started running it and this is what I see in my clients. So like what used to be the gold standard was to do a four salivary collection for testing people's cortisol yes. levels to see how their adrenals are doing. And then we started to recognize that how your cortisol actually spikes in the morning, like it should be at a certain level when you first wake up and then it actually should go up from there mm -hmm. as you get going mm -hmm. in your day and then come back down again into your regular kind of coasting off throughout the rest of the day. That's a normal cortisol curve, which wakes us up, gets us going, gets our brain fired, gives us a sense of calm, a sense of focus, a sense of being able to like move through our day well. Well, one, just testing that fifth, that that second marker that now you have five in salivary is really helpful to get a true picture of how the adrenals are doing. Yeah. But then what I'm finding is I will have clients who their salivary cortisol is low. So it looks like their adrenals are under functioning or they're not having enough effective, but their urine metabolites of the breakdown products of cortisol ah. is really high. So their free cortisol is super high, even though their total cortisol they're burning is low. through it. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah, yeah, you yeah. don't necessarily want to now juice up that person's adrenals with a lot of glandular supplements. You want to do yeah. like adapted adaptogenic herbs that are going to balance the system. You want to actually do both a supportive, like nutritional supportive for the adrenals, but then maybe calming herbs because you actually mm. have somebody who's in a hyper stress state. They're yes. pushing hard on the gas pedal, but their body's starting to decompensate because their, their actual active salivary cortisol isn't very high. And yeah. I would have never known. I wouldn't have sure. seen that without the urinary metabolites. And so it just gives a little bit more of a balanced picture. Then you also can tell when somebody's really tanking because their urine metabolites are low and their salivary cortisol is low. And so you actually know like, oh, we're we're running out of gas here in the tank we're right. on fumes. And then vice versa, if you actually see everything is high across the board, you know, they're in that initial alarm stage and their body is just on high alert. And then the other thing I like about that company's test in particular is in the exact same samples on the same day, you get estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, melatonin breakdown. So you see this yes. kind of more global picture of what we often talk about is the, the, the stress hormone cortisol robbing the precursors from the other yeah. more balancing Cortisone hormones. Steel. And it's just, yeah. again, from an educational standpoint, I can bring it home for the client really well by saying, look. What you want is your sex hormones high and feeling good and a good libido. And you want your skin to look great. And like this, these, all this like things that we kind of go for, it's able for me to give them the education piece of the reason those hormones are not doing as well is literally because everything's draining towards your stress hormones and they can just see the pathway. And so I really like that full picture in time. The only yeah. thing that's tricky about the Dutch test is women's cycles are not all the same all the time yeah. and hitting the right day exactly dead on. So I often still will run serum hormones. So I'll run blood tests for estrogen, progesterone, testosterone to just make sure like our raw materials are where we want them to be. And then I also will do the Dutch test and get a sense of the functional hormones because it, I have had times where I've had the Dutch test come back and it looks like somebody is really low on their hormones, but it's really more, we missed the peak. And then I do mm -hmm. the blood test and I'm like, no, you're, you're making plenty of hormones. We just didn't nail exactly the right. Cause for people that are listening, your estrogen and progesterone fluctuate on a daily basis. There's a curve. The first half of your cycle from the time you bleed until your, your ovulation date, 
estrogen is the dominant hormone and it comes up, but progesterone also rises during that time. Then they fall off and then progesterone starts to rise. If you ovulate and the egg is fertilized and you get pregnant, the progesterone maintains the pregnancy. If there's no fertilization, then it just drops off. And then when both go to zero or go nearly to zero, that's when you actually bleed and have your period. So it all depends on what day we nail it. And there's mm -hmm. like, we say around day 19 is when their right. peak should happen. But you can have someone with a short cycle, long cycle, or the real one is when they're irregular. They're like, well, it's 24 days last month, but then it was 30 days this month. And, yes. then it's, and so I don't always do the Dutch test until three or four months into working with someone because I want to get a good sense of what their cycles are. Now, mm -hmm. with men, you can do it whenever you want. And with, mm -hmm. you know, menopausal women, you can do it whenever you want. But with cycling women, we have to kind of time that test correctly. And I want to have a good amount because it's 400 bucks. I want to yeah. have a good amount of confidence that it's going to be worth it when we run the test panel. But that's that I've shifted in that direction because I really like the complete picture we get. Yeah. Well, and it's funny. Thank you for sharing because I historically would do salivary and I just recently started yeah. step, stepping into the world of both. Yeah. And I, I was literally, as I was getting ready earlier this morning, I'm like, I need to do a little more reading so that I can substantiate my approach on this. Yeah. So you just yeah. got rid of my reading. Thanks. Sarah. Great. You're welcome. <laughs> See collaboration. <laughs> I know it's so good. I'm trying to think about some of the big, well, Oh, I am going to ask this question because my patients ask me all the time. I'm curious about what's your take on food sensitivity panels? Oh, I, you know, I, I mostly don't run them. <laughs> I run them periodically, yep. but usually, you know, situations where I'll run them. If I'm really scratching my head going like, wow, we've been at this for like three months now and these wackadoodle reactions, whatever they may be, yep. skin, digestion, you know, hormones are still happening that I might pull out the food sensitivity panel fatigue. Right. But yeah, I do them. I, when I, when I was a new practitioner, I would do them with frequency. And it, part of it is like, you know, people love them because they can understand them. They're like, yeah. they can understand, Oh, I'm reacting to this. I'm reacting to that versus like D A T A S what, you right. know, like, you know, so people will, as I'm sure you experience, like will come in asking for them. Now I far less frequently order them and way more often ask people to trust me to guide them. Right. Yeah. Like let's use your money in a more effective way because I don't think you're going to get the outcomes you're looking for there anyway. But I will do them once in a while. I've been playing around with the P88 test. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say with mixed results, I'm not, I, I think it's a, I think it's a pretty good test. And I'm most interested around that whole, like, you know, they're testing the IgE, but also the IgG4, mm -hmm. right? So, and, and of course, IgG and a complement also, but that complement I've not encountered in another food sensitivity test before. Um, Dunwoody Labs does it too. They're the other okay. ones that do. do. So, so yeah. to take this back to the people that are like, what did they just say? Yes. <laughs> yes. So you and I are on the same page and, and I've kind of guided people away from food allergy panels unless we like, and I literally will say, look, if you just need a piece of paper that tells you why you need to eat clean, then we can run it. Right. But more often what I find is the body responds to foods in so many different ways that it can cause problems. And the tests tend to only look at a couple of them. So if you're positive, you're positive, but if you're negative, they may not actually, it's not a home run, like, oh, you definitely don't have a problem with that food. And, and then I also have clients who come into me already, they've been trying a diet, so they've been restricting their foods. And then when we go to run the food allergy panel, they're not going to have a strong of a reaction because you actually have to have to have been eating the food for the yeah. immune system to react strongly. And so I don't really like being like, well, let's put you back to suffering and eat a bunch of foods that are bad for you so we can get the right test result, right? And then there's all these different things you can test. You can test. So IG is for immunoglobulin. It's literally a kind of antibody and they, they lettered them. So there's IgE is like your standard allergy reaction. IgG is in giraffe is like the delayed hypersensitivity. You can eat something and your body can take up to 72 hours to react. And then there's IgA, which there's more companies incorporating that into the testing to try and get this broader picture of like covering all of our bases. And that mostly is on our mucous membranes. So like it's all down the inside of your GI tract. So it could be resulting in GI inflammation. And then 
complement is actually outside of, so what most people tend to think is that the inflammation is everything. Well, inflammation is actually only one way the immune system deals with healing itself. Then there's antibodies, which is actually a different pathway. So complement is something we can measure from the inflammation side of things. So it, it, again, it's like broadening the, the information. I actually used to use a lab test and I don't know what their current name is, but what they did is they didn't measure the specific molecular reaction. They actually measured the size of the immune cells and how they I know shrank. I you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alcat did it that way. And then there was another company that did it that way. And, and like for a while, I liked that because they're not giving, so it's not specific. You don't know exactly what, what the body's reacting to, but you know, there's a reaction. So I was a little bit, it was like, my net would catch more of the positives. So I knew more clearly and also gave you a sense of leaky gut, like on right off. Cause if they had a broad sweeping, lots of moderate reaction to lots of foods, you knew you were dealing with more of a leaky gut GI inflammation issue. But what I found is the results aren't there. People change their diet. They follow it to a T and we get like almost no advantage. The people who I do run them and I recommend they run them like frequently is when I am dealing with someone who wants to naturally work on reducing epilepsy. Mm. They want to work on like, like major illnesses where there's so much going on in the body. And then I'm like, you want to do a food sensitivity test every three months or every mm. four months because your immune system, as soon as you change your diet, it's going to shift. But we can literally take like, 20% of your body's inflammation out of the picture by following this. And it's like, when there's significant, we've got somebody who's like, when they react, it tips them into a non-functional state. And epilepsy is the one I can think of right now, but things along those lines. But when I have someone, what they're dealing with is low and slow and constant, and they just have the same symptoms all the time, every day. And we just need to slowly rebuild their vitality I haven't found that it's made as much of a difference as just enrolling them and like, I'm not kidding, you need to eat clean and here's what clean means for what you have. And then we just do it in the diet and then you wanna test it and you wanna try and see what happens when you haven't eaten pizza for four months and then you add pizza back in and see what symptoms change. Like that's the gold standard that your body's gonna talk to you. And it's like, so I I can see that we're in a similar both. Yeah. I also, and I'm sure you've had this experience too, speaking of body talking to you, you know, when I, there have been times in the past when I've done a food sensitivity test and someone going into it has said, you know, I, I do eat eggs, but I'm pretty sure they're a problem for me. Yeah. Right. And we do the food sensitivity test and they don't come up reactive to eggs. And they're like, huh. I'm like, but no, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, like if you feel, yeah, I trust your experience, you know, if you, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it is there. It's interesting. The wide world mm -hmm. of food sensitivity tests. I've probably run a couple hundred of them. And I'd say there's been like four or five patients where literally we had like a hole in one where there was a food that they didn't know about that now they avoid and they feel much better. It's just not that often that I get right. that clear of a result. And then I don't actually see a lot of people in this category, but people who are like way deep in major, major, major illness that actually can be helpful because it's just, it's just like, like I said, clearing another layer of smoke out of the room to help, help clean up their picture. But yeah, 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 yeah. So interesting. God, I want to be like, and what about this? And what about this? But we actually totally. been talking for almost an hour. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love it. So cool. So what I want to wrap, where I want to kind of complete here is we've talked a lot about gathering the information and gathering the data and how do we even what what what's what is optimal health what are we aiming for what are some of your like okay if you had five minutes to tell the world these are the best things you could do to take care of your health and well-being what are your like top most important things that people can can be doing or adding into their life well kind of perfectly for how how you kicked off our conversation the first one would be to get clear on your intention for your health mm -hmm. and your life. You know, uh, what is your intended future for your health and what will that make available? You, you said a little bit about how, you know, you're a traditional physician really would never ask what are your health goals, right? But I, I think maybe another question that could really shift the world is if healthcare providers far and wide started asking why is this important to you? 
you know, why is it important to you to handle this? Why is your health important to you? Whatever the, the concern that's coming, why is it important to you, right? So the what and the why, what is your intention for your health? Number one, the next thing I would say is really getting connected to that daily, like remembering daily what your intention for your health and your life is, because sometimes there will be actions that aren't super compelling, right? Donuts are delicious. <laughs> and I want to stay up and surf the internet until 2 a.m., whatever it is, right? It, you know, it, like there will be actions you'll need to take and you'll need to help yourself make those changes. So in my experience, I've tried it. The stick on the back all day long doesn't work. Like beating myself up, yep. not typically a very good way to create and sustain change, right? So I gave up that stick a long time ago. And, you know, the thing to step into is like, how do I have this carrot dangling experience? It's like, well, I have to remember what the carrot is. And then my relationship to the work can start to change. Another thing is, you know, making sure you know what actions are going to be effective. Right. And, and I'm certain a lot of people do have at least a good idea of where they could start. So that's great. Start with those things. And if you hit a wall, like you're not sure, work with someone, you know, collaborate with someone like Sarah or myself, who this is what we live for. Like we love doing this work. We love guiding you. You triumphing is a triumph for us. And so, you know, partnering with someone to produce the outcomes you care the most about. And living a game, I would say, of living in a conversation called what is my best game right now? Like, what's the best choice I can make right now? I'm a huge fan of ditching the all or nothing approach. Yeah. And I call it mastering your middle ground. And that requires a little bit of inquiry and learning, right? Because sometimes you're not going to play your best game. And so if you can reflect on that and learn what didn't work and how you might do it better in the future, then you can walk away with some actions. And, and so really, but coming at it from like, okay, what's, what's the best choice I can make right now? Whether it's, uh, you know, I, I really wanted to move my body for 30 minutes, but my work just took up 20 minutes more than I intended. Great. You know what? You do have 10 minutes. So as opposed to saying zero, let's take that 10 you know, get that movement for 10 and, and celebrate yourself. Yeah. Like I really, I'm such a huge fan of people counting their wins. When I work with people, I was just commenting. I was working with a woman on her shared Google document and she was saying, she was commenting on how she had a cookie, but she only had one. I was like, and she said it was such celebration. I was like, I'm celebrating that you're celebrating because I want you to acknowledge yourself. Like it takes something to make these changes. And, you know, it's kind of like how we would be watching a little kiddo learn how to walk. Mm -hmm. When they fall down, we, we cheer for them to get back up and they take a few steps and we cheer some more. And it's like, how can we be like that for ourselves? Yeah. I love that you didn't just say diet, exercise, and sleep. Like I actually like, you know, like, like what are the top things people can do to change their health? And you were like, Get clear on your intention, you know, mastering the middle gate, like celebrating your wins. Like, it's so awesome because I do think that we have, speaking of beating things with sticks, like, like that's not news to anyone. It's like, what's your access to how you nourish yourself and how you move your body and how you rest and how you take care of yourself and how you play? Like, it's in these. And I would say that two of the other things that I bring into my practice a lot is listening to your intuition and getting in communication with your own body. I think that a huge amount of what we're actually dealing with is this disassociation, this disconnect, and we're disconnected from ourselves. And, and then we have a medical culture that literally gets trained to not listen to people to only look at labs. Like don't trust what the patient says. They probably don't know what they're talking about. Just look what the numbers say. And I find so often it is my client's intuition or their gut sense about something that we, we look and, and, you know, come up with really good, clear things to see, like either how we can finally have them take that concern of like, oh, my grandmother died of ovarian cancer and I'm, I'm petrified. It's going to be me too. And we actually do the investigation so they can put that fear to bed and be mm -hmm. done with it. Or where we can actually say there's some intuition there and sure enough, like, hey, we should take some proactive steps towards preventing this, right? 
So listening to your body, getting in communication with your body. And and another way I kind of bring it home is if your body was a member of your family, describe what your relationship would be like with them. Do you even talk? That to is them? so well said. I do love you that, Sarah. Yell at them all the time. Like, do you incur? Like, what is that? How do you communicate with that family? You know, family we're stuck with. You didn't always choose them, right? Them so it's like pretend they're not there, right? Yeah, <laughs> and like, and that brings it home for people of like, if you separate that out and you look at your body as not you, as a member of your family, how have you been doing so well in that relationship? So building that relationship, and then the other one that I would say is massive is I think we all think not only should we have the willpower to be able to do this, we should be able to do it by ourselves. Well, I should know. I should just be able to, I should just, I should, I should, I should, I should, right? And so what I actually find is the biggest missing ingredient and the people that are the most successful is when they create partnership. They get into some sort of accountability. They they do something with a buddy, And then what can be very challenging is when a spouse or the family at home isn't on board, it's like fighting this uphill battle. So I always offer that people, spouses or kids or whoever's at home at some point can jump on a call with me, either with that person or alone. And it's just a bonus. It's just part of, I don't charge like a regular fee for that. It's like, because my client is going to have such a hard time if we don't have buy-in or at least understanding at the level of the people they live with. And so it is a community thing and our health is coming from our community. And I also find that when people start to shift their health, it goes out, like then their kids start changing some things and their husband or their wife starts changing some things, or they start to see stuff in their friends group, which is great. You get to be that source for other people when we shift it. But there's such this concept that we should be able to just do this by ourselves on our own. And when you, when I ever, I've had people that get into places of partnership or groups or working with a buddy, it, their results go through the roof because it's like, I mean, mine do like, I do way better when I've committed to go to yoga class with a friend versus when I just put it on my calendar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's true. The power of par- partnership is, is real. It's not yeah. one plus one equals two. It's one plus one equals yeah. 10, you know? Yeah, exactly. <gasps> This is mm-hmm. awesome. Jesse, thank you so much. Clearly we could keep going and I think we've filled people's heads enough. And I actually love where we ended up in that lab conversation because I haven't done that yet on heel, not like that. And I think it's something that a lot of people, and there's so many of these functional tests that are just on Instagram and they're showing up and people are like, well, I don't know, is this worth it? What do I do? And And that's another whole thing of like, not all lab companies are created equal and they don't all have the same quality control and reliability in their test results. It's like they're testing what they're testing. But the question is, if they tested that same sample 10 times, would they get the exact same results 10 times? And particularly around any of the assays with PCR testing, which is what they do with food sensitivity in particular, a lot of times there's a lot of variability. So like you really do want to work with somebody who can point you to the credible lab companies. So you're not tossing money at things because then you get the results back. You think they're like the truth and they might be, they right. might also not be that accurate. And it's like, right, right. you want to make sure you know that it's worth it. So there is a, a whole world there too. So this was, this was super helpful. This is really great information, Jesse. Thank you so much for oh my your gosh. commitment, your wisdom, your expertise. It's awesome. Thank you, Sarah. The same to you. It is, you know, such a joy and a pleasure to have these like deep conversations, you know, with someone who is all in it with heart and mind. So thank you very much. (laughs) Until we get to do it again. Awesome. Can't wait. Thank you to today's guest, Dr. Jesse Haymeyer for her enthusiasm and brilliance. For all the resources for today's show, visit sarahmarshallnd.com slash podcast. Special thanks to our music composer, Roddy Nickport, and our editor, Kendra Vicken. And as always, thank you for being here. We'll see you next time.